Okay, hello everybody. We're gonna dive into equity portfolio management. Now, what I want you to think about here, we're gonna take a deep dive into passive equity investing. Uh, pretty much you've noticed over the last really decade or more, we've seen more and more assets going into equity investing. And what's interesting, we're now starting to see twists that are emerging in equity investing, especially using factor investing methods, where we're actually seeing more and more almost active passive trading. And we'll get into this in a little while today. But just know passive equity investing, okay, you want to invest passively. You, your client thinks the market is efficient and they don't want to pay all the cost. Well, how are you going to do it? So understanding how to invest passively has become very important. It's very popular. A lot of institutional clients like this as well. So you're going to need to cover this. And it's certainly testable information on the CFA exam. So let's talk about, first of all, we need to think about choosing a benchmark. What are we going to do? What are some key considerations? Well, first of all, it's going to have to be rules-based, this benchmark. It's going to have to be what we say consistent objective and predictable rules. I have to understand, your client has to understand, the portfolio manager has to understand how does somebody be chosen for this benchmark? Is it the S&P 500? Is it Russell 5000 or Russell 2000 or Wilshire 5000? Whatever it is that you're using, we need a rules base that's consistent, objective, and predictable. Okay, we need to be transparent. So it's got to be public, clearly stated, and it's got to be understandable to investors. Hey, the rule is I spin a wheel every day and I figure out which stock I'm going to put in my portfolio. Um, that's, not, that's not understandable. Well, we understand what you're doing, but it's certainly not consistent, and it's not going to give any predictable results. Okay, and this is probably the most important thing. It's got to be investable. Investors have to be able to replicate both this return and the risk performance. Okay, so for a benchmark, key considerations, we need to be conscious of all three of these, but I'm going to lean a little bit heavier on investable. If I can't invest it or my clients can't invest in it, then how's that a reasonable benchmark? Okay, so when we're choosing a benchmark, let's dig into market exposure. So what market segment do you want to be involved in? Are you going to be domestic, international, emerging market, maybe frontier? And what about capitalization? Large, mid, small, blend? You've got to define these and figure out where you want to be. What part of the market do you want exposure in when you select that benchmark? And then also growth versus value and any other pertinent risk factors that you've identified. So again, you decided you want to passive invest. Now you know how to build a benchmark, but now you've got to choose which one that you want. Now, what are some risk factor exposures that we have to consider? So really what we're getting down to is I want to know what's the sensitivity of my portfolio returns to various risk factors, whichever risk factors that I'm worried about. So what are some risk common risk factors? Well, beta, that's a common risk factor. Or what about firm size or style? Momentum, maybe liquidity. Okay, so we're just trying to figure out which risk factors do we want exposure to in this benchmark. And some other factors, we talked about liquidity already, volatility, maybe firm quality. Maybe we want to think about environmental social governance investing, or maybe no fossil fuels. You have all sorts of ways that we can define which factors we want or which factors we don't want. Okay, so once you decide to choose this benchmark, we've got to figure out the weighting method. 
So are you gonna use a market cap, which is extremely common? If you do, make sure you focus on free float weighting. Okay, what if you use a price weighting method? Well, it's not common, and what's a weakness of this price weighting methodology? Higher price stocks are gonna be more heavily weighted. Is that okay? Maybe it is for you, but if it's not, that's what's going to happen if you use this price weighting mechanism. And again, it is not a common investment strategy. Equal weighting. Well, just like what we talked about before with price weighting, what happens? Well, we tend to have more volatility and small cap, which tend to be low liquidity stocks, especially compared to large, they're overweighted in this equal weighting weighting method okay and then we can also do a fundamental weighting maybe i want to weight by sales or dividends or income again whatever fundamental factor that i think is important i can build that portfolio to do that and that weighting method for the benchmark okay the next thing we need to think about is how do we replicate the stock concentration of that benchmark. So one of the things we kind of turn to our economics uh, professors and our economics research to help us here. So we can use the HHI index, and we'll talk about this in a second, but this HHI, or Herfindahl index, is going to be interpreted as the number of stocks in an equally weighted portfolio that mimics what the index's concentration. Okay, so we can use this using the HHI index. That will help us capture this concentration. And we can actually use the reciprocal of the HHI to tell us the effective number of stocks that we need to equally weight in order to mimic this, in this index's concentration. So let's just say you take the S&P 500. So we have a 500 stock index with an HHI of 0.01. So it actually means the effective number of shares is only 100. So this 500 stock index has the concentration risk of 100 equally weighted stocks. Okay, so this is an extremely powerful tool, and it, it's a nice little nuanced twist on the HHI index, but ultimately, it helps us figure out how to replicate that portfolio or that benchmark. Okay, the next thing when we're dealing with benchmarks, there's going to be ongoing adjustments. Things happen. Mid-caps become large-cap. Small-caps become mid-cap. Large cap might become small cap, okay? So there's gonna be some rebalancing issues. So first of all, we're gonna to have to update the stock weights to reflect changes in market cap. So we're gonna to have to rebalance from time to time. We might have to reconstitute. So hey, this mid cap is now a large cap stock. It no longer fits, or our small cap becomes a mid cap. So reconstitution is absolutely an issue. Now, keep this in mind. The more you rebalance and the more you reconstitute, they create turnover. What does turnover do in your account? It increases trading cost. And what that means is you end up with more tracking error that we're going to cover later versus the benchmark. You're not replicating that benchmark's returns because of all the turnover and trading costs. Okay, so what can we do to deal with this reconstitution issue basically with these benchmarks? So I want to reduce these trading costs. I want to reduce this tracking error between the indexes and these reconstitutions that we're doing. So one method we can use is buffering. So let's have a buffer zone or a threshold for this change in stock's capitalization rank that must be met before moving it. Maybe we say, okay, this is the top 200 companies that we're using, but 
it has to be one of the 150 companies before we'll consider it putting it into our portfolio. So we can create this buffer zone. We can also package. We can move half the portfolio into the new index. And then at our next date, if it still applies, let's go ahead and remove the remainder of this position at the next reconstitution date. So again, buffering and packeting, these are two ways that we can reduce trading costs. I'd like you to be comfortable with those terms for the exam. Okay, now we get into factor-based versus market weight. This is what's really happening in the industry. There are so many factor-based passive strategies, and this is why I was talking about it's almost the passive funds are becoming almost actively managed. In fact, they are being actively managed. So we can take CAPM. It's a single-factor model. Uh, now, multi-factor models, they can consider multi-risk factors. They don't have to just focus on one. So the risk and return of these securities in this overall portfolio, it's going to be impacted and be determined by the sensitivity or exposures to these factors. And again, whether they're ESG factors or dividends or market cap, whatever it is that we want to factor into our portfolio or factor out of our portfolio, we can use. So indices with high exposure to a specific risk factor can be created. We can replace this market cap weighted index method. We can base it by other factors than market cap. Okay, so factor weight portfolios have the same exposure as an index to that specific set of risk factors. Typically, they're structured as ETFs, but here's the thing. They have higher fees and trading commissions than passive capped weighted investing. Why? Because you're doing things differently. You're slicing and dicing the market a little bit more and the rebalancing and the reconstitution become issues that kind of add this tracking error that you deal with. Okay, so Fama and French, 2015, they revised their three-factor model to a five-factor model. So what are they saying are the sensitivities of a portfolio? Well, market risk beta, firm size, book to market. Yep, 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 agree. That was in their three-factor model. Now the revisions. They said operating profitability should be an equity risk factor and investment intensity. How fast, what is the growth rate of those assets? So again, an interesting twist to the original three-factor model by Fama and French. Now, we can also focus on returns-oriented index. Maybe I want to overweight stocks through momentum. So if you've outperformed the index, I want to overweight you in my portfolio. A lot of people love dividend yield. I've seen this in a lot of passive funds. So we can overweight stocks with high dividends. We can also overweight based on our definition of some fundamental that we need to focus on. Maybe it's dividends, sales, income, whatever it is. Okay, so we've gone through a lot of information on benchmarking, how we want to, what makes a reasonable benchmark, how to actually design this, how to reconstitute, how to rebalance. Now let's figure out what are some factor-based strategies that we're seeing out there that's brought up in the curriculum. Well, we could have return-oriented. Maybe we want to focus on yield. Or maybe we want to have some momentum. We can focus on risk, you know, and minimizing risk. We can actually go into and make these portfolios safer, or at least we think we can make them safer. And then finally, we can build these factor-based models that maximize diversification. So as you can see, the, the market cap... ETF 
has now been spiced up. There are a lot of things that they're doing now where they're kind of bringing active investing into passive management vehicles. Now they are increasing the cost from a standard, ba a, a standard passive market cap fund, but they're isolating factors that their clients want or that they think that can add extra return. So don't get too distracted by this material. It's fairly basic reading. I think the cap and material here is fine. Um, so keep plugging along and make sure you have a good understanding of passive equity investing and at least this idea of a benchmark. And I want you to be thinking about factor-based strategies that are being implemented.